We pay taxes. We deserve the same thing that everybody else does. So I decided to do that as I've taken on other issues. And the way I wanted to do it was the same way that Catholic Charities does it, same way Jewish Federation does it, and I wasn't going to do it any other way. I wanted to do completely with equality. So this building is different than any other building in America in two respects. It is first, the first um, LGBT friendly building in America with that designation from a federal agency being HUD. It is the first one. And the second one is, the second distinction it has, almost $20 million and not one penny came from the LGBT community. It is all tax credits um, and uh, state, city, and federal funds. I think for Frank Kennedy and what you were saying, I can see like, we pay taxes too, we deserve the same thing. Everybody else does. Right, Randy? I mean, I think the word equality is very fair. That's what we want. Yeah, our special rights will want fairness. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, the Catholic Church Federation, nobody at the other thing that makes this building interesting, um, I kept waiting for there to be pickets or something or other. Nobody in the entire region ever complained about it. In fact, every single senior organization in the entire Delaware Valley, which is a five county area around Philadelphia, supported the project. Fantastic. Well, it is a great accomplishment. So, my congratulations to you again, Mark. Good team. Um, so, lessons from history, the third part of our interview here, discussion, um, conversation. Um, so having been a part of making our history, and not having written about your personal role in it, uh, I'm wondering what kind of ideas and thoughts you might have today about what's the meaning of this history. I think the, the most important and the use that you put to. Yeah, I think it's amazing that how much of our community doesn't know any of our history and doesn't really care about our history. And I find that I've been doing the Gay History Project with gay newspapers around the country for the last 10 years. And every October, which is Gay History Month, we provide newspapers free of charge all around the country with articles about gay history. Um, for the most part, most of the publishers and editors, when I would call them, would yawn um, and tell me, well, you know, our readers aren't going to read that. And I said, you know, it's okay. It's still about history, and we're putting it on the record. And someday they might be interested in that stuff. You know, so we at least have it on the record. And we've been doing this year in and year out, and we've had some incre incredible interviews. Uh, the first interview we had for the first year was Barack Obama talking about what he knew about gay history. Yes, we had Barack Obama talking about gay history in 2008. We also had um, Hillary Clinton. Uh, we also had Barney Frank. We had Elaine Noble. Anybody know who Elaine Noble is? Um, Elaine Noble is very important to our history. Um, simply because she was the first woman who was elected to a state uh, state house anywhere in the United States. And does anybody know who the first elected official is anywhere in the country? Alan Yeah, Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, very good. Yeah, and does anyone know who the first gay, openly gay candidate was? Jose Saria. Nope. Jose Saria. Very good. In San Francisco, city supervisors, a trans person. So, I mean, our history. And the first gay organization was 1925. Most gay people don't know any of that history. And one of the great things about the book was that I got to immerse myself in that. I got to, to read practically every book on gay history that was out there. And a lot of you, including you, I used the source material. Um, and it was, that part of it was just lovely. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but what you can learn about our history is that our civil rights movement is no different than any other civil rights movement. You know, I used to, one of the things that I really appreciate about President Obama is in his inauguration speech, he compared us to other civil rights movements in, in that very beautiful line, um, Selma, Seneca Falls, Stonewall. Um, I cried when I saw that, and uh, called Jerry Hughes, and two of us just cried on the phone for about a half hour. Uh, and the reason I cried at that, and the reason I felt so emotional, is I, and I'd like to ask you, Randy, and if you guys feel, as I do, that we've always been made to believe that we're like secondary civil rights movement, not as important as those other civil rights movements. Randy? Yes. Yeah. And I felt the same way. And uh, I refuse to feel that way anymore. And I thank President Obama for that. And
And I think by learning our history, that's what we learned. And that's the reason for that cover action. Um, I think young gay people don't realize what we did to get us where we are today. And so I wanted a dramatic picture. Um, and uh, I'm glad my publisher agreed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that was a big uh, discovery for me when my book came out. And it was really ignored by the uh, media, except for the gay media. I got a, a review by the Boston Globe that I was generally otherwise ignored. And uh, I had lots of new material, and it came out on the 30th anniversary. So I thought it would get noticed by some. Should have been. And so that, that's what made the scales fall, fall from my eyes and realize that our, our history is not seen as legitimate U.S. history, legitimate civil rights history. That's why I started saying that needs to be a man of our movement. And I've also always said that, you know, if we're going to ask other people to take our history seriously, we have to take it seriously. <coughs> going back to what you said, it's important that, that we read our own history. You know, and so we I, all don't have to agree with, no, agree yeah, with I mean, one of the great things, I mean, there's things in your book that you'll disagree with, I'm sure there's things in my book that you would disagree with, um, but that dialogue is important for history. And it's like one of the things you did in your book, which is tremendous, was that you proved the fact that there were lesbians in Stonewall. Nobody else had done that before, proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt. That was important. Um, you know, and I... I think that, you know, by keep looking at our history, we still have some of us that are still alive. I mean, those people need to be talked to. Their histories have to be recorded before they're no longer here. And so people understand. I mean, people don't realize the enormity of the hate crimes that have been perpetrated amongst the gay community. I was going to do a chapter um, just listing the thousands and tens of thousands. I want you to hear that line again. Tens of thousands of gay people who were literally killed or destroyed in some way, shape, or form. And the closest I came to it was one line uh, where I talked about lobotomies. And I think, um, I, I believe I acted to the figure there, 40,000. Think about that, 40,000 lobotomies. You know, and we're second class civil rights movement? Sorry, no we're not. We were fighting for our lives. You know, and then that's, I don't know if you have an AIDS question there, but literally in 1980s, we did fight for our lives. And here's, uh, this might be a little controversial, but I'll say it anyway. Um, all those privileged white people who wouldn't join GLF in 1969, 70, 71, and wouldn't join GLF, Gay Actors Alliance later than that, all of a sudden, in the 1980s, they came out of Fire Island and they wanted to be radicalized. Where have they all been? People all often step forward and play for the very effective Yeah, They weren't listening to us for, you know, over 10 years before that. Your life is in danger. Come and, you know, free yourself. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, AIDS was a great uh, turning point. Anyways, um, let's see. Um, well, uh, since this is World Day today, let me ask you: What do you see as the most pressing needs today with regards to this disease and this epidemic? Uh, to make people realize it's still there. That's the first point. And to take a look at a dramatic look at what the drugs that are out there, what they can do to you, what the drug companies tell you they can do to you and some of the things the drug companies don't tell you they can do. Um, I mean, I gotta tell you that in the 80s, I could tell you every single drug that was out there. Um, we were the first paper to report on AZT, do you remember that? It was the miracle drug, turned out to be poison later. Um, but, uh, I, in fact, I still keep a bottle of AZT in my desk drawer to remind me of that kind of reporting. Uh, and. It, William Way, uh, who the William Way Community Center is named after in Philadelphia, it was his AZT. And I keep it there to remind me of him, community, and part of the fight we fought. Uh, but today there's this thing called PrEP. I know you know about it. Then there's PEP. Um, and I don't think most young people know the difference in what you need to do, when you need to take one, when you need to take the other. You have to take it for, a long, you know, a long, for the rest of your life. What's it going to cost you? What insurance plans cover it, which don't? Um, we at PGN are now doing an exhaustive series on it, which will begin in January. 
Um, and I think the point being is to stay with it. And every single January, uh, AIDS Day for this week, and I didn't bring any with me, Philadelphia Gay Ga News always does an AIDS supplement. Eight pages in the, in the middle of the paper, which pull out and uh, can be used as a guide to everything you want to know about HIV AIDS. And we also print up about 5,000 extra copy of just those eight pages. And um, this afternoon at noon time, we had newsboys handing them out in Center City, Philadelphia, which is something we've done for the last 20 years. Um, well, given your own involvement in the LGBT media, uh, what do you think is the state of LGBT journalism as it stands today? I think if we do it right, it's going to be in a very good place. Um, I can tell you what we do in Philadelphia and a few of the other newspapers, but I don't know every city specifically. Um, niche media, which means covering just one area, is supposedly the, the new media. It's going to be the hot item. But I can tell you for us, it certainly is. PGN uh, has 13 full-time employees. They all get full health benefits. They all get, uh, if they want, 401k. Um, uh, we're doing very well. We make a profit, I'm happy to say.